we were treating acute myeloid leukemia with 7 and 3 in 1977. We are still doing the same in 2018. What is the best way forward to change by 2028? Now I know that acute leukemia is not your uh, area of expertise. So why don't you frame it in the background of breast cancer and tell us uh, how the treatment has changed and do you what do you see moving forward will be the most dramatic way of improving the current paradigm? So breast cancer, as you probably know, is not a single disease. And I think one has to look at it from that perspective. Uh, much of the improvement in best breast cancer treatment from the surgical perspective has been that we do less, which means that the patients have more benefit. And so we have been quite effective in reducing the morbidity of surgical treatment. And that, I think, is a success. Uh, in terms of medical therapy, for a long time, uh, everyone got treated with morbid therapy that was not necessarily useful for them. And the improvement that's happened over the past five years or so is that we have been able to back off medical therapy for many women. So for women with favorable breast cancer, I think things have improved. For women with unfavorable breast cancer, so breast cancer that's resistant to disease. I'm not sure we've made much progress other than being able to recognize that it's unfavorable. But the way forward, I think, is with clinical trials. So there are obviously hypotheses that come out of experiments that should lead to clinical trials, and the way to success is in doing the trials, answering the questions, and going to the next step. Great. Well, question number two. There are three and a half million papers on cancer, 135,000 in 2017 alone. There's a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and translation to improve therapies. What are we doing wrong? So great scientific insights should lead to improvements in therapy. The challenge is to, one, identify the agents that are tolerable and useful in the clinic. But also, I think, equally important is our communication with our patients to persuade them that we don't necessarily know the answer to the, the best treatment for them. So if they are willing to, um, to participate in trials that will, uh, to allow themselves to be randomized, in other words, to treatment that will either potentially help them or not, uh, that's the way to really answer the question whether a new treatment is helpful. So I think what we need to do is persuade people in general, and particularly the patient in front of us, that there is uncertainty about the value of medical treatment, and the only way to address the certainty is to be able to do these clinical experiments which, which uh, requires that the patients see our uncertainty. So we need to be able to confess to patients that we don't necessarily know the answer and patients need to recognize that that confession is not a confession of weakness or lack of knowledge, but it's a, it's a recognition of the uncertainty of present knowledge and that in contributing to that process that they may actually gain from it. So I think that is in fact 
a major failure of clinical medicine and particularly of academic medicine that we are not able to convey to people that our uncertainty is a reality and that recognizing that uncertainty is something that can help us move forward. So it's, it's hard for doctors to convey lack of knowledge, but it's very important for us to convey lack, lack of knowledge because that's the only way people recognize that what the doctor tells me is not necessarily the best thing. We have to recognize our biases and do the experiments, the clinical experiments that will take us forward. But it's a two-way street. We can't do the clinical experiments without the people being experimented on being willing to participate. Okay. Question number three. Fact that children respond to the same treatment better than adults seems to suggest that cancer biology is different in the two. But it also suggests that the host is different. Not just the cancer itself. So since most cancer incidence increases with age, even having good therapy may not matter because the host is too de decrepit. Your solution? So it depends on uh, what you, I mean, where you introduce the idea of being decrepit. <laughs> So, I mean, a 50-year-old adult and an 80-year-old adult are different. Um, I think there's obviously, we all know that there's a natural rhythm to life and that as people age, uh, they are less able to tolerate insults of a variety of kinds. And the... So if you're talking about really aged people, you know, people who are what we would call decrepit today, in that situation, I think the solution is to recognize that there's a natural end to human life and that we should, that trying to prolong it is futile in some ways because we cannot prolong it indef indefinitely and the quality of that life, if it's prolonged beyond, you know, enjoyment of life and, and value is, is probably futile. So, but for people who are adult and, and in a point where they are otherwise healthy and have cancer, uh, they too don't respond as well. And I think there the challenge is to, you know, continue to look for the answer because uh, in many solid tumors anyway, there has been progress. And, uh, and, and again, applying the progress in the right setting to the right people requires clinical experiments. Okay, good. Question number four, you have great knowledge and experience in the field. If you were given limitless resources to plan a cure for cancer, what would you do? I would not plan a cure for cancer. I think applying limited resources to a cure for cancer is not what humanity needs. Cancer is a disease of aging, as you just said. And so if people don't die of cancer, they'll die of, you know, heart disease or neurological disease or some other event. So having a goal of, you know, a uniform blanket goal of curing cancer, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, if I had limited resources, I would think about ways in which the lives of people could be improved in many different situations, not just with cancer, because there are many other very morbid diseases 
that cause early death, that cause loss to families, that cause suffering. So I think there isn't a situation where I can think about just, you know, devoting limited resources to the cure of cancer. I don't think for humanity that's a realistic limitless or necessary goal. Not limited, limitless. Resources. Limitless, I said, limitless. If I had limitless resources, I would think in a broader way of where those limitless resources should be applied. I'm not sure that applying them to the cure of cancer is necessarily the best use. There are certainly, I mean, there's suffering that goes with cancer and to alleviate suffering is obviously important. And so then, you know, with each cancer, there are different solutions. But, to, but the idea that we will improve the lot of humanity by curing cancer, I don't subscribe to that. What if I limit the question to just cancer? And okay. you have limitless resources, you can do anything you want, then what would you plan? Then I think that... Um, so as you know, I, I work a lot on prevention. And so I think that first encounter with cancer actually imposes a big burden on, on a human. And so um, identifying ways to really reduce the likelihood of running into that diagnosis and having to face treatment for it would be a very worthwhile thing to do. Um, the other area that is important is to identify, because cancer has a broad spectrum, of course, and there are cancers that are, in fact, not a big threat to health. That may not be true in hematologic diseases, but for solid tumors, that's true. So um, I think many people have talked about this, that, that one needs to recognize you know, cancers that are likely to cause trouble from cancers that are not likely to cause trouble. So, so distinguishing between them would be an important area to, um, to put the resources towards. Um, and then finally, you know, some cancers are going to be lethal. I don't think there's any, any avoiding that because cancers are clever, as you know. So eventually a cancer that has a, you know, bad nature is going to be able to work around whatever we throw at it. So, I mean, some people will die of cancer. So eliminating cancer, I don't think, is a realistic goal, even with limited resor limitless resources. Okay. Uh, last question. More philosophical now. Offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancer, palliative but toxic treatments is a service or disservice in the current therapeutic landscape. So someone who has non-curable cancer is symptomatic and is also going to experience symptoms from the treatment. The only solution is to be honest with the patient and say, your cancer is causing you these symptoms, your treatment is going to cause you these symptoms, what would be your preference? Beautiful answer. Thank you very much for your time.